In this video, I'm going to break down the biggest scandal in the healthcare industry, and that's saying a lot. I'll walk you through how a bunch of pencil-pushing pharmacy middlemen became so powerful, they bought out the biggest health insurance companies and pharmacy chains, and did it through hiking up drug prices, kickbacks, and taking advantage of government contracts. This is the story of pharmacy benefit managers, or PBMs, and how they became the American drug cartel. UNFTR. All the work that we do here is made possible by the love and support of our members. For information regarding our properties, go to unftr.com. There you can sign up for our free weekly newsletter, browse our directory of progressive resources, view our archive of stories and exclusives, and find information on our line of coffee, manufactured in partnership with native coffee traders. This one's called Unfuck Your Morning. Also, this is going to be a pretty meaty video, but it's a condensed version of the podcast that we release on our feed. So if you're not familiar with our podcast, that's where this all started. So search UNFTR wherever you listen to podcasts. Now, the essay for this episode, a list of sources and resources, and a glossary of terms is also available at UNFTR.com. As always, make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel because it really helps us out. The one thing that seems to unite Democrats and Republicans in D.C. is that PBMs are out of control and have to be reined in. For the past two years, the Federal Trade Commission has been stonewalled by PBMs in its attempt to pierce the opaque pricing system behind prescription drug prices. This prompted Congress to jump in and try to figure it out as well, and the sentiment is pretty universal that PBMs are a significant driver of pharmaceutical costs. And yet... Despite the fact that the FTC theoretically has dominion over trade, and Congress literally crafted the laws that made PBMs juggernauts in the healthcare industry, neither has made meaningful progress bringing PBMs to heel. Now, before we get too far into the weeds, let's go back to understand why PBMs even exist. According to the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, or NAIC, Quote, when insurance companies began offering prescription drugs as a health plan benefit in the 1960s, PBMs were created to help insurers contain drug spending. Originally, PBMs decided which drugs were offered in formularies and administered in drug claims. In the 1970s, PBMs began to adjudicate prescription drug claims, end quote. Simple enough, right? So when prescription drugs were originally introduced into the marketplace, it was a very straightforward relationship between the manufacturers and the patients. So essentially, once a drug was authorized for personal use, physicians were given the ability to prescribe. A patient could take the prescription to the pharmacy where the drug was given to the patient, assuming the patient could afford to pay for it. Now, it's easy to see how this was incredibly inefficient. Because we had no central healthcare system to speak of, there was as much competition as there was variation in drug prices. Because holistic and centralized approaches are anathema to the capitalist system, it was from the start left to the marketplace to solve two things. How could these transactions happen at scale? And how could more people access this explosion of life-saving pharmaceuticals? To help us wrap our heads around the role of PBMs and the history of prescription drugs, I spoke with Antonio Chacha of 46 Brooklyn Research, an Ohio nonprofit corporation whose sole purpose it is to improve the accessibility and usability of U.S. drug pricing data. We'll talk more about 46 Brooklyn and the work that they've done, but first, let's hear from him on the origins of PBMs. If you were a sick patient in the 1950s, all right, you would get prescribed something from your doctor. And that medicine would be made by a, uh, one or many pharmaceutical companies. And you could go to one or many pharmacies to obtain those medicines. And if you couldn't afford it, well, you probably didn't get it, right? And that wasn't a great thing. But conceptually, our willingness or ability to buy something can create tremendous pressure on price. There's a reason that gallons of milk are $10, $20, even though you might have three publicly traded companies that are involved in the development and sale of that product, right? Because we as consumers communicate with our purses and wallets to say, I won't buy that milk if it isn't priced reasonably. 
I'll, I'll buy a different type of milk or I'll buy something different altogether or I'll shop at a different grocery store. Uh, in general, companies have to be sensitive to our wants and desires as consumers. The same thing was true in pharmacy, that if a medicine was produced and regardless of where somebody was taking liberties with price, if at the end of the day it was unaffordable for a patient, that meant that somebody went without that medicine. And so in general, that created healthy competition between manufacturers, wholesalers, and pharmacies to ensure that the end price was at least reasonable. The problem with that approach was that sometimes people couldn't afford their medicines. And so many people could be disenfranchised by the costs associated with pharmaceuticals, even when they might be what you and I might consider to be affordable. And so as over time, uh, we started to look at pharmaceuticals and say, hey, like these are really integral to our well-being and might help us save a lot of money on medical expenditures. So it was actually the United Auto Workers in the 1960s who, through collective bargaining, got coverage of pharmaceuticals through their benefits plans to say, look, these are great value adds to us as workers. We want to integrate them in. And that was seen as a great victory because, again, it didn't make sense for somebody to go without their medicine. But the second that you say that conceptually, well, now you're losing a degree of price sensitivity, right? The question then is, is if we say that somebody must always have their medicines, what message does that send to those who charge for those medicines? And so over time, we started to say, all right, we're going to cover more and more medicines, which was good. But over time, as we covered more and more, now that traditional pressure was starting to be relinquished by us as consumers and handed over to insurance companies and pharmacy benefit managers. And PBMs were brought in to be efficient efficiency experts, right? To process pharmacy claims on behalf of our health benefits plans to say, okay, this drug is covered. Here's how much I have to pay as a consumer and you know, ensure that the pharmacy is made whole, et cetera. Well, over time, uh, as, as more and more medicines came to market and as more and more people started covering medicines, well, we as consumers eventually lost our power and ceded it over to health insurance companies and PBMs. We no longer were the consumer. Uh, now it was the PBM and the insurance company. And so rather than just saying to the PBM, process the claim, we look to the PBM to say, maybe don't just pay what the pharmaceutical company wants to charge. Maybe don't just pay what the pharmacy wants to charge. But instead, let's have the PBM negotiate on our behalf, which is actually a very you know, union-like mentality, right? It's almost like a collective bargaining arrangement where a PBM is working on behalf of many to shake down a drug company or shake down a pharmacy for bigger and bigger discounts. That all sounds very good on paper, right? Like there's, there should be nothing absolute, there should be nothing wrong with that, except when you start adding in how significantly concentrated the PBM marketplace became over time. If you can get better discounts through leverage, well, then it stands to reason that you should try to gain more leverage through mergers and acquisitions. And so you have an arms race to the point where today you have three PBMs who make up over 80% of all pharmacy transactions just at the PBM level. We can get into vertical integration and how that's less or more of those companies over time. But really where things started to go awry was PBM started to taste the forbidden fruit rather than just working to make claims more efficient and pass along the savings. They started to make money off the very transactions they were hired to control. They started getting paid by drug companies in exchange for covering medicines. They started opening their own pharmacies. They started marking up the drugs. Fast forward the tapes today. Most people probably have never heard of a PBM. But the three largest PBMs are Fortune 15 companies, and they're larger than the drug companies and pharmacy companies they were hired to control. All right, so let's walk through some of what Antonio just revealed in the history of PBMs, because the timeline is really important. So if you recall from our healthcare series, and if you didn't see that, you can check it out online at unftr.com. Just go under the little series bucket and you'll see it right there. Insurance coverage in the United States grew asymmetrically alongside the economy and population growth. So as far back as Lyndon Johnson's administration, the federal government has been trying to chart a path toward universal coverage of all Americans. But it was unions 
who pushed health coverage as a membership benefit to combat wage disparity and regulatory pressures. This worked for a time because it created large buying groups that essentially centralized the purchasing power in the healthcare market from hospital stays to prescription drugs. Now, in turn, this put reverse pressure on private employers to create their own buying groups by introducing employer-sponsored health insurance plans. Now, understand that the system developed outside of the purview of the federal government because it was believed that providing health care to everyone would bankrupt the government. There was already a sense that the dual great society plans of Medicare and Medicaid would ultimately topple the federal budget. Adding anyone to a shared pool seemed politically impossible given our insistence on balanced budgets. So as the healthcare field matured and private companies jumped into the fray, we moved further and further away from universal coverage while other developed economies were just adding taxes to the broader populations to cover the expense of administering a public system and driving costs down as a result. For their part, PBMs were essential to the pharmaceutical equation. Though it's important to note that spending on prescription drugs was nominal in the early days. Very few plans incorporated this type of coverage outside of high-end private plans and the unions. So throughout the back half of the 20th century, PBMs were essentially pencil pushers. They were claims administrators, shuffling paperwork between pharmaceutical manufacturers, wholesalers, benefit plans, and pharmacies. Drug X was made for Y amount, paid for by the patient, or the insurance company, and everybody in between got their fair share of it. And then, in 2003, the Bush administration signed Medicare Part D into law in the Medicare Prescription Drug Improvement and Modernization Act, known as the MMA. Ah, yes, the Mixed Martial Arts Act of 2003. It took a couple of years to work out, but starting in 2006, Medicare recipients could sign up for Part D to cover prescription drugs. And that's when a light bulb went on at the PBMs. Let's go back to our conversation with Antonio to understand the scope of the pharmaceutical supply chain. So there are five main pillars of the prescription drug supply chain. Drug companies sell drugs to drug wholesalers. If you're unfamiliar with a wholesaler, McKesson, Cardinal Health, Amerisource Bergen, they sell the drugs to pharmacies and the pharmacies are ultimately compensated with some combination of the patient's money and the PBM's money, which ultimately comes from the health insurance company. The health insurance company and the PBM are hired by the plan sponsor or the government program, et cetera. Now, there are other, a lot other mediaries in the system. There are switch operators. There are rebate aggregators, GPOs, PSAOs, a whole bunch of alphabet soup that you, know, you will lose all your audience, trust me, if I go through them all. But understand that there are many mouths to feed within the prescription drug supply chain, each one of which can have a distorting impact, positive or negative, on the prices that we pay. Okay, so, so far we've heard how the three largest PBMs control 80 to 90% of the market. And all three are in the top 15 companies in the United States. Well, in this brief rundown of the supply chain, it's also worth noting that the three wholesalers that Antonio mentioned are also in the top 15. That's McKesson. Cardinal, and Amerisource, which recently changed its name to Sencora. So we have six of the top 15 companies in the United States, all within the pharmaceutical supply chain. But if we widen our lens for a moment, you can make a case that three others, Amazon, Costco, and Walmart, are also part of this cartel. While not their primary revenue drivers, all three are invested in prescription drugs and angling to make further inroads into the marketplace. So Nine of the top 15 companies in the United States are all primarily or peripherally involved in the prescription drug game. Now, here's where things get really fucked. In theory, the market should have worked out the payment system to bring drugs to market at the most efficient price possible given the size and the buying power of the market. But as Antonio pointed out, the consumer is no longer driving drug prices. The consumer is not the customer. Pharmaceuticals exist in a captured market that is different from other industries. Again, Antonio. I know that there are analogous marketplaces from what I understand from others. Uh, people have, uh, have told me that uh, auto dealerships and their relationships with uh, car manufacturers might be somewhat similar. I've heard people use analogies of Ticketmaster 
and and Live Nation, right? I'll be honest, I'm less sophisticated with the dynamics of those marketplaces. Um, what I think there, what I think has tremendous uniqueness in this space is that, you know, I there are a lot of different suppliers of cars, right? There are many different uh, op- opportunities to buy a vehicle. You can go direct. You can use any number of, of outlets. And if there's vertical schemes going on, right, that can inflate the, the price of a car, well, the good news is there's used cars and there's, you know, cheaper brands out there that ultimately I still have an opportunity to go buy. And in the worst case scenario, I can ride a bike or, you know, I could, I could decide, I could make decisions, right? With tickets, I just not go to the damn show, right? Um, with drugs, I don't really have those choices, right? Um, it's life or death. Um, and I can't just go get a different medicine. The medicine I need is the one that I need. And so you really have a more captive consumer base, if you will, than you do in other marketplaces. And furthermore, because of the nature of how uh, the finances of medicines work, because they're not priced in a sober way anymore, meant to entice a cash paying consumer, it's unrealistic to buy medicines at this point within a system that is governed by inflated prices and negotiated discounts. Because if you decide, hey, I'm going to go on it on my own, I'll pay out of my own pocket. Well, the prices weren't meant for you to pay with cash. So you really are captive to a degree within a system. And anytime you need to work outside that system, bad things can happen. This is where layers start coming in. So Antonio is talking about capture, the necessity of the products and the avenues in which they're made available. Now we'll get to pricing, but let's hang here for the moment. There are places you can go to pay cash for prescriptions. In fact, there's a few independent pharmacies and startups like Mark Cuban's Cost Plus that allow you to do just that. And oftentimes the prices are less than what you would pay at a chain pharmacy. So how can that be? There's also the question of availability. As Antonio said, you have options when it comes to buying cars. You don't have to go to the concert, so Ticketmaster is avoidable. But prescription drugs are quite often necessary. So here's two things to consider here. Who decides which drugs are made available and what price will the patient ultimately pay? The answer is the PBMs. Now, nowhere in the description of why and how the PBMs came to market were these factors ever even mentioned. The original purpose of PBMs was to lower drug costs through bulk purchasing power and just to manage the flow of payments through the claims management process. The drugs themselves were supposed to be priced by the manufacturer, marked up by the wholesaler, and sold at the pharmacy at a retail price. Now, the last step is either covered by the patient out of pocket or through insurance. Now, insurance companies do add a wrinkle to the process because, of course, they get to decide which drugs will be covered based upon the price inputs, availability, efficacy, and a host of other factors. And for their trouble, they too get a cut of the action in the spread between the premiums they charge and the payouts they're responsible for. Okay, for posterity, let's do this again really quickly. The manufacturer sets the price of a drug. It costs them X to make it, and they sell it at Y. Then the wholesaler buys it from them at Y and marks it up for the effort to distribute it to all of the pharmacies. Then the pharmacies themselves get to charge Y++ for giving it to the patient. Along the way, the insurance companies get a piece for knowing who gets the drug through their plans, and the PBMs take a fee out of the middle for the trouble to track all the paperwork and to manage regulations. That's how it's supposed to work. But That's not how it actually works. When the government added Medicare Part D, it basically created a massive new market, the biggest market in drug history, in fact. According to the Office of Health Policy, in 2022 alone, 43 million Medicare D enrollees filled 1.1 billion prescriptions. So instead of developing an internal mechanism to set drug prices, like every other country does, and track claims through a centralized system, like every other country does, the U.S. government basically handed these responsibilities to the PBMs. So from that point forward, PBMs not only managed the claims process, they were also given the authority to negotiate drug prices. The theory being that their buying power would be so enormous it would drive down the price of drugs from the manufacturers who were all too happy to have a guaranteed marketplace of seniors. And the PBMs did indeed use their leverage to drive down the cost of drugs. It's just that the patients didn't reap the benefits. The PBMs did. They 
kind of sort of pocketed the money, but in a really underhanded way. Here's Antonio again to help us follow the money. Well, context is everything here. The, the first thing I would say is that PBMs are doing a very good job at lowering the cost of medicines for themselves, right? You know, they, they're in the business of using their, their, their might and their strength and their sophistication to materially get large discounts from drug companies and pharmacies. And they're very successful at that, uh, at paying below what they would other, that manufacturers and pharmacies would other li otherwise like to charge. The, the rub is, are they passing along that value, right? I think they are. They're passing it to shareholders. Uh, and in some instances, they are passing it through to their, their clients and their patients. But in aggregate, there's a significant amount of, in, of inflation that I think you and I and any onlooker would say is beyond the pale, right, of what is supposed to happen. But wait, there's more. Essentially, PBMs couldn't just pocket the difference straight up but they didn't have to because they had a back door to doing so. In addition to negotiating prices, PBMs were also in charge of the formularies. Enters formulary into ChatGPT and a formulary is a list of drugs that are approved for use by a hospital, health plan, or other healthcare organization, and that will be dispensed through participating pharmacies to an insured person. Someone, somewhere, had the bright idea to allow the pencil pushers to determine which drugs get covered by the insurance companies. The result? PBM suddenly became the most important link in the supply chain. Can't get paid for a drug that isn't on the reimbursement list. As you may have guessed, Antonio has some thoughts. Let's look at insulin as an example. Insulin is a drug that has been much maligned for its pricing over the years. Uh, and you'll see over time that the large insulin companies are taking almost lockstep price increases over time to the point where something that um, should be very cheap and has been around for a long time, and there's three main manufacturers that are making that product, one would assume that that competition would result in lower prices for that medicine. But the opposite is happening. You're seeing prices increase significantly over the last decade, save for this past year where we can talk about why that is. Sure. But you've seen insulin prices just become increasingly more expensive over time. So the question then is, if PBMs are in the business of finding the lowest priced versions of medicine, and there's three main suppliers of insulins, why aren't they competing with one another to undercut, to, to get favor with the PBMs in terms of coverage? Well, the reason is, is because we have a system of kickbacks. PBMs and drug companies have exemptions to federal anti-kickback laws that allow drug companies to give big kickbacks back to PBMs in exchange for preferential treatment on what we call their formularies, which is like the menu of drugs that a PBM will say is covered under your benefit plan. So as I said before, how patients are no longer really the consumers from a manufacturer's perspective, right? it's the PBM. If I'm a drug company, I don't sell my drugs to, to patients. I sell them to PBMs. Ah, uh, horseshit! Now, as if that all isn't fucked enough, it actually gets worse. In addition to minting the PBMs by allowing them to set prices, determine formularies, and get around federal kickback regulations, the government also turned a blind eye to vertical integration within the supply chain. For that, we head back to my conversation with Antonio. Can you talk about um, and maybe use an example of a vertically integrated PBM and all the areas that they control along the supply chain. Yeah, you have a company like CVS Caremark, right? Uh, yep. you, people will recognize the three letters CVS is the pharmacy. Caremark is the PBM. Uh, that same company owns Aetna, which is one of the largest health insurance companies in the United States. They own CVS Specialty Pharmacy and Mail Order Pharmacy. They have their own wholesaling line of business where they partnered with Cardinal Health and actually act as the largest purchaser of generic drugs as a wholesaler. Uh, so they're right there. We talked about earlier one of the five wow. main pillars of the drug supply chain. All right. Health insurance company, Aetna. PBM, Caremark. C CVS, Pharmacy. Wholesaler, Red Oak Sourcing. Well, now CVS launched a new subsidiary called Cordavis. 
where they are actually taking inventory of drugs and slapping labels on them, essentially becoming quasi-drug manufacturers. So here you go. The largest companies in the system are now basically the entire drug supply chain all rolled up into one. That is staggering. Uh, Okay, it's probably as good a time as any to talk about who Antonio is and why he's such an instrumental voice in this story. Antonio's organization, 46 Brooklyn, is a data journalism nonprofit that dug into drug pricing in Ohio, specifically related to Medicaid reimbursements. Hold that thought. In the summer of 2016, if you're unfamiliar with Medicaid managed care, um, the old school Medicaid was essentially you would create a fee schedule. And they'd say, okay, we'll pay you for everything that you do. We'll cover the cost of the drug and then a set dispensing fee. Over time, governments look to come up with a private-public partnership in Medicaid, where they said, okay, rather than just paying direct every time, we are going to turn over our Medicaid business to private health insurance companies. We call managed care organizations. Some of them are United Healthcare, uh, Aetna. Molina, Centene, et cetera. And from a state perspective, the idea is trying to create more predictability. You pay an insurance company a per member per month fee, they go out and buy all the Medicaid stuff, right? And so in Ohio, we had five Medicaid managed care plans. Four of them were all using the same PBM CVS care mark. The second that CVS care mark got all four plans on non-transparent arrangements, all of a sudden, pharmacies saw a significant cut in reimbursement to the point where, I mean, I saw pharmacies that were losing 60 to 80 percent in their profitability in the Medicaid sector within a month time span. Mm. If you're unfamiliar with Medicaid, Medicaid serves the poorest of poor in every state. So if you were a pharmacy in an underserved community, right, those cuts were the death blow, right? And so we saw about 200 pharmacies close their doors within a three-year period over the time that these cuts occurred. Long story short, 46 Brooklyn got a hold of pricing data from various sources and through data mapping determined that the state was overpaying the managed care organizations for Medicaid by $245 million in just a single year that they examined. So this kicked off a wave of reforms in Ohio that in turn kicked off investigations in other states, which is why PBMs have found themselves in the hot seat with the FTC and Congress. So now we can add state Medicaid plans to the tally of fuckery occurring at every link in the prescription supply chain. So we've got kickbacks from manufacturers, overbilling Medicare and Medicaid, hiking up prices, buying out competitors and creating monopolies, swallowing up the supply chain one link at a time to the point where in certain cases, they own the wholesaler, the insurer, and the pharmacies themselves. And there's no one to hold them accountable because the regulations were designed to foster this behavior. And now, just one final bit of fuckery to really get your blood boiling. And this one's personal. If you've ever had a sick person in your life who required life-saving or life-preserving medication, and you've had the option to work closely with a local pharmacist instead of a corporate chain, you'll understand this one. Local pharmacies are just different. A great pharmacist is the last line of defense, that last gut check in the medicine dispensing chain. They catch things like drugs that conflict with one another. When refills are due, they see patients, they know patients. When my mother was ill and on myriad cocktails of cancer drugs and other related issues, the pharmacist was there every step of the way. No question too big or too small. They stayed open late. They dropped off packages at the house in emergencies because they knew her. And so when the prescription stopped because she passed, I went to visit them and it was a small family owned business. And so when I went, the pharmacist and the family members who worked behind the counter all stopped what they were doing and came out to see me. I didn't have to say a word because I couldn't, I couldn't get any words out. And so with a bunch of customers quietly waiting, we all just hugged and we cried. And that's healthcare. That's the difference between corporate chains and a family owned pharmacy. Well, here's what PBMs have done to them. And I wanna get this right. So we're gonna read directly from the Pharmacist Society of the State of New York's website, or PISNI for short. Currently, 
There's no law preventing PBMs from owning retail, mail order, specialty, or any other type of pharmacy. A clear conflict of interest since PBMs not only negotiate which drugs will be covered and at which cost, they have direct and proprietary access to their prescription drug benefit plan enrollees and can use their access as a platform to guide, steer, direct, or mandate which pharmacies plan enrollees can use. PBMs use their role as drug plan administrator to entice plan enrollees to use PBM pharmacies by offering incentives to patients that they directly disallow other pharmacies to use. For example, a PBM can offer a 90-day medication supply for the price of 60 days at its mail-order pharmacy, but prohibits the local community pharmacy in your neighborhood from being able to do the same thing, even though your community pharmacy may be part of the PBM's pharmacy network. Furthermore, CVS and Express Scripts have been caught in the act and fined for engaging in misleading scare tactics that pull patients away from their local pharmacies to a CVS or Express Scripts, quote, preferred status, large retail pharmacy, claiming if patients don't leave their local pharmacy, the price of their medication will greatly increase, end quote. So the reason that thousands of locally owned and operated pharmacies have gone out of business over the past two decades is due to this gangster behavior. To make matters worse, because PBMs have essentially been deputized by the government, they routinely conduct Medicare and Medicaid audits of independent pharmacies, which cost the operations an enormous amount of time and money. PBMs basically shut these operations down on a regular basis and make them jump through onerous hurdles and levy hefty fines even when they find no fraud, waste, or abuse. And they do it to just force pharmacies to appeal and go through the process. All the while, the audits produce something else. Data. These audits force independent pharmacies to hand their customer data to their direct competitors, who then magically solicit the very same customers with mail order options that might have lower costs associated with them. So here's the final tally. According to the NAIC, there are 66 PBM companies, but the three largest, Express Scripts, CVS Caremark, and OptumRx, control approximately 89% of the market and are serving about 270 million Americans. Adding insult to injury, there have actually been amazing legal and technical developments in big pharma with the explosion of generic drugs. According to a white paper out of USC Leonard D. Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics, the use of generic and biosimilar drugs saved the healthcare system $338 billion in 2020 alone. And none of the savings went to the consumer. Imagine that. $338 billion in savings from generics and biosimilar drugs in a single year, and yet consumer prices went up. Where did it all go? Well, because of the lack of transparency among PBMs, no one can say for sure. But dig this. Take the big three that we just named. Top line revenue for OptumRx in 2023 was $116 billion. For Express Scripts, it was $150 billion. For CVS Caremark, $178 billion. The big three took in over $600 billion dollars in 2023 alone. This isn't pharmacy, it's not wholesale or insurance company revenue. This is the revenue specifically allocated to the PBM divisions of these Goliaths. So even though we don't know, we know. Now, according to Lever News, quote, a total of 24 bills related to PBMs have been introduced in the House and the Senate during the 2023-2024 congressional session, end quote. Several of these bills actually made it out of committee, but none has made it into law. And the lobbying groups on behalf of the PBMs have really started to turn up the heat and the donations. Despite the stonewalling of the FTC, Congress is on to the PBMs because of the work of groups like 46 Brooklyn that use hard data to expose price discrepancies in the market. Another study conducted by a medical journal compared the cost of 184 different drugs between Medicare claims and Costco which has more than 500 stores nationwide and a mail-order business for members. And it found that, quote, 
Medicare overspent by 13.2% in 2017 and 20.6% in 2018 compared with Costco member prices for these prescriptions, end quote. The difference is the streamlined and transparent system employed by Costco, which demands transparency from its benefit managers. Now, obviously, the PBMs are singing a different tune. For example, CVS Caremark cites research from the, wait for it, University of Chicago. Say it loud, say it with me, yo, yo f Milton Friedman. And writes on their website that the data speak for themselves. Well, U Chicago finds that, quote, PBMs deliver nearly $150 billion annually in value through negotiated discounts, more cost-effective drug utilization, and other cost-saving services. Almost $60 billion, 40% of that value, would be lost in a world without PBMs, end quote. Now, of course, they're probably right about PBM negotiating power delivering $150 billion annually in discounts. They just omitted the part about kickbacks that drive the whole cost up. So it's like retailers who mark up clothing items by 50% before putting them on sale for 25. So the trillion dollar question is, what happens next? Now, given the state of intransigence in DC, it's obviously impossible to say. But if any major issue that we've covered has a shred of optimism attached to it, it could be this one because Congress seems pretty aligned in their antipathy toward PBMs and how they're being stonewalled. And regardless of which side of the aisle you're on, there are very clear wins to be had. First off, it needs to be definitively said that the United States is the outlier in the world because we don't have universal health care. I mean, the whole issue of affordability and accessibility goes out the window if we do the most logical and human thing, and that's Medicare for all. But even in this scenario, considering Medicare has ceded its power to the PBMs, it's not immediately obvious that the cost of prescription drugs reduces to a more reasonable level. I mean, it is for the consumer, but assuming nothing changes in the relationship between Big Pharma and the PBMs, shareholders would continue to reap massive profits and the government would then be exposed to cartel-like behavior in the middle. That's just the nature of this particular public-private partnership. The fact of the matter is that PBMs shouldn't even exist in that scenario. The government would have to take over formularies, claim adjudication, and pricing on a wholesale basis for prescription drugs to fit rationally within a universal system. And that means unwinding a trillion dollar plus industry. So this is just one small window into just how complex and wide ranging the dismantling of our entire system would be. And for shit sure, the appetite for this does not exist in either the Republican or the Democratic Party. But where there is some potential optimism is in the regulatory measures and proposed legislation to eliminate rebates and demand transparency in the system. Now, the biggest lesson of all, as usual, is that when it comes to the health and welfare of citizens, capitalism has never been the answer to maximizing outcomes. And that's the story behind the real American drug cartels. Go to unftr.com for a full list of sources and resources, for the essay that this episode is based upon, and for a glossary of helpful terms. Thank you to our members for making all of this work possible, and we'll see you in the next video. Here endeth the lesson. <laughs>